Sugar and Karapur. I'm with the Department of Radiation Oncology. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot, you know, it was nice that Dr. Piorecki and Dr. Farr was able to give a nice background talk, so I just kind of have nice pretty pictures to show <laughs> than anything else. Um, now, usually, you know, in, is, originally, historically, we were doing, doing uh, surgery alone for a pancreatic carcinoma for resection, and of course, we realized that the patterns of failures are primarily local. So about 50-80% occur locally, you know, liver is one of the cause of local regional recurrence and peritoneal mets then, you know, kind of a little bit wider area. It's rare to get distant disease without having to, rec having recurred locally first. And so that obviously brought up, uh, brought up a point of, well, what can we do locally to treat these patients? And that's where in the late 70s and early 80s, we started doing radiation treatments kind of local regionally after surgery to prevent uh, local recurrences. And since the 1980s, unfortunately, there's not been a lot of changes in either, as Dr. Farrar showed, in chemotherapy. We got Gemzar from 5FU, not much change. And the radiation really hasn't changed, except the techniques have ha improved and the patients are doing much better from the side effects. So I'll kind of show a little bit of that. Um, the radiation, in addition to doing it adjuvantly postoperatively, which is probably the best uh, area to do it, we can also do it definitively when patients are not able to go to surgery, whether they're medically inoperable, whether the, um, it, the, the patient's uh, the artery or the vein, the portal vein is involved, and they can't get definitive surgeries with clear margins. And the other area is preoperative. The new adjuvant that Dr. Faro didn't go through, um, because I think that's important, because for patients who are minimum, uh, uh, almost borderline resectable, if we can shrink the tumor enough for them to get the most definitive treatment, which is the surgery, um, that would help a lot. And there's different techniques we can, uh, we can do to get those patients through it. The problem with pancreas is that normal tissue, it's everywhere, the, you know, the, anything in the abdomen, it kind of moves around with your breathing, with just, you know, the bowel and everything, and it's like a minefield of normal tissue. You've got the liver, you've got the small bowel, you've got the stomach, you've got, uh, and you know, the, the large vessels, you've got the kidneys. So everything, and of course the spinal cord, I forgot about that, uh, everything there, there's, some, you know, there's, there's a limit to the tissue toxicity, so they were very limited in that area how much dose of radiation they can give. Um, so, you know, what they came up with in the 1980s was called three-dimensional conformal radiation treatment, which is basically doing kind of, we do CT scans, make a three-dimensional rendering of all the organs at risk, and kind of coming in with different, uh, you know, programming to be able to kind of get a, away from the organs at risk. Now, the traditional external radiation is about six weeks, Monday through Friday. Tumors don't grow on weekends, which is very nice. And, uh, you know, it, it is toxic. It is, you know, I showed you all the normal tissue around there, so it can have a lot of toxicity and side effects. So when we started out in the 1970s and the early 80s, before the era of 3D, a lot more toxicity. This made it a lot better. Uh, then came IMRT with better software, with better computerized programming, and these are actually, this is actually the crest of the Cambridge University, and this is actually a, a radiograph of Einstein. Um, we treat with small strips of tissue, and we can modulate the beam. We can tell the computer kind of how much dose to give in that strip. So we can come up with, you know, higher dose, lower dose areas and higher dose areas to kind of paint dose uh, in, in and around the abdomen area. And that's called the Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy, or IMRT. That was a huge step above that really significantly improved. Again, the doses did not go that much higher, but the toxicity lowered significantly. Now, there's, you know, we don't have it here, uh, but proton therapy I get asked about with patients all the time. Usually with uh, radiation treatments, you know, the beam comes in, it deposits its dose, and gradually it improves. So every time, every beam that's coming into, in, into the patient, it's depositing its dose there, and it can have potential side effects. Protons, on the other hand, go into the middle of the, you know, go very deep and then deposit their energy. The problem is, these are the maps of the existing and planned proton facilities. There are just not very many of them out there. Uh, the closest one to us is Jacksonville, this planned center in Miami. I've been hearing about it for the past eight years. Nothing has happened yet, and they're still talking about it. Uh, one of the problem is that, you know, if you compare, you know, you need a cyclotron to produce the protons and then it goes into the areas where the patients are treated. These facilities can run anywhere from 40 million dollars to about 120 million dollars. So obviously you know because of just the, the financials it doesn't make a lot of sense 
but it works well for, for certain patients. And you get these beautiful curves where there's very little dose um, elsewhere, and you just get the mass right at the center without causing any toxicity to the surrounding area. So it's a really great potential area of treatment, but the only thing is if we can get that $40 million down, um, it would be very nice. So this is a comparison of the traditional you know, radiation treatments, and these are kind of the, uh, the, these are the uh, different beams coming in, with the red being the 100% dose that you want to treat. This is what protons do. If you look, these are the low dose areas in the blue, and if you can see this, just the tumor is getting the treatment more than any, th any organ, and it's very good for pediatric patients, very good for tumors that are deep-seated in the abdomen. Again, pancreas is a, pr is a, is a prime example. Trying to do, deal with the limitations of radiation, uh, we have CyberKnife here at our center. And the idea is basically robotic radiosurgery. So this is the same robotic arm that's, uh, oops, uh, that's uh, available you know, in auto companies and things like that. And we put a linear accelerator that uh, uh, treats uh, with x-rays. And the idea is that you're monitoring breathing constantly and uh, there's being input into this machine so you can treat well with a with a motion organ uh, organ motion you can kind of you know figure out how to treat uh, just the surrounding areas with many pencil beam uh, pencil beams to not treat the surrounding area so that kind of gets over the limitation of the radiation treatments and it's radio surgery because we're actually giving such large doses that we actually cause tissue damage in the organs um, and that's, we can treat, you know, up to about five fractions, you know, instead of having 28 to 33 fractions and do better, do just as well, most times even better than, than the traditional radiation treatments. So you're delivering really high doses with great accuracy. Um, this is a, a little, um, a, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this kind of shows how, oh. Sorry, that's why we team oh, okay. up together. <coughs> Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. First one? Yeah. <coughs> it was embedded originally in my... I know, but so, it's very yeah. special in these ways. So we're, we're constantly monitoring the breathing and the computer, and everything is going into the computer to treat at many different areas. And of course, the robotic arm can treat at just about every different angle um, to treat right in the middle to wherever you know, a spinal cord tumor, everything, we can tr avoid the spinal cord and treat the tumor right there using multiple different uh, uh, pencil-like beams with very limited damage to the, to the surrounding organ. So you might have seen, you know, I know Memorial advertises and so does uh, North Broward about their CyberKnife Center and that's, you know, we do have that available. Um, go back now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> right. go and then we don't need the other one. Uh, so you get actually, you can get actually very nice Again, dose to you know, say, pancreatic mass without treating the, the local organs. You know, livers here, kidneys are here, and so it it does help a lot. And there's a lot of trials ongoing to see whether the surtactic radiosurgery will be better than traditional radiation <coughs> treatments for for patients uh, for our patients uh, with pancreatic carcinoma. So, Dr. Pirek also wanted me to talk about the nano knife a little bit. It's not really radiation, but uh, I've seen it. Ad I've heard it advertised uh, for University of Miami. Uh, this is a concept that's not new. It's, uh, it's what's called electroporation. You kind of, uh, you disrupt the, um, the cell membrane with an electrical current. And basically what happens is uh, then you get leakage in the, in the cell membranes and eventually you go to pre-programmed cell death, what's called apoptosis. And that's what your goal is always. This has been observed since the 1890s, uh, but it's taken up till now to find a functioning unit that can actually work. So uh, the advantage is that it's minimally invasive. It's very good for patients who are not eligible to get like a big Whipple procedure. Uh, there's less, less healthy tissue damage. There's some, because obviously you can't you know, limit the, the electricity to, to a certain area, but you can limit it between probes, and I'll just show that in a little bit. Um, and it's a quick recovery, but in shorter hospital stays than what Dr. Pedereka was talking about, the, the days in the ICU and all that, it's usually two to four days in the hospital and not in an ICU. So it does require general, general anesthesia. The electrodes are placed anywhere up to, um, you know, anywhere from two up to six maximum, and you send the electrical pulses between these electrodes. Um, it's a two to four hour procedure time, and this is kind of what the machine looks like, and these are the electrode probes. Um, 
this is a, a, an illustration of, an, of a nano knife. So these are the three electrodes, and the currents kind of go in between them to disrupt the cell membranes. And this is, you know, this being the tumor. Of course, in and around that area, you're going to get some damage to healthy tissue, just as in you do with, you know, with chemotherapy with radiation treatments. But that's an option, at least, for another option for patients. It's not. It's FDA approved for soft tissue treatment of soft tissue tumors not specifically for pancreatic, but it is being used more and more in pancreatic. Um, and I think the University of Miami has that, but we unfortunately here at this point don't. Um, so that's definitely another option for patients. Now, you know, when I got into the field, you know, I didn't know what happened when I was exposed to radiation. I was really hoping to get superpowers, but, you know, <laughs> uh, instead, you know, really the treatment is for cancer. Um, you know, when you see, you know, radiation in, in different areas, um, I was hoping to turn to Spider-Man or the Hulk, but unfortunately, just turned me into a radiation oncologist. So, <laughs> any questions about new radiation treatments? I have a question. Mm -hmm. I just recently was reading some information, and I, I found that radiation therapy it says increases the vascularity potential. How does that really work? I don't. I. I haven't really come across that because sometimes you know, there, there's chemotherapies that can increase the vascularity of the, of the tumors and actually we can use radiation to sometimes cauterize tumors as well, you know, with cervical cancer, with bleeding and everything, so it, it really shouldn't. Now, to, for the radiation to work well, you do need a well oxygenated tumor because the hypoxic tumors, the areas with the necrosis, they do, they do not respond to the radiation therapy as well, though. So I have to, I have to check up on that because I, I'm not aware of I thought I was kind of funny because I was, I was a little confused myself. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. And then I was thinking because I know um, at the World Healing Center, they were talking about um, patients with radiation coming and, you know, they're able to, they're hoping that they will heal some of the patients. So I was trying to make that connection. I said, well, maybe that, the other one might work. But I thought it was more on a friable basis. And then I, I said, well, I, I'm not sure how it was working. Yeah, I, I have to check into that because I, I you know, we, we use it to actually, you know, cauterize bleeding and, and, and things like that in patients, actually. Is there any other questions for our medical